Welcome to this new podcast series brought to you by the Electrical Safety Network. I'm Dave Austin, and I'll be hosting the programs along with Gary Gundry, technical author and trainer, who brings insight from the contracting world and specialist knowledge from BS7671, the regs, and on-site guidance. Today, we open up consumer units and peer inside to understand the evolution and practicalities of this commonplace item that we all deal with at some point. Our special guest, bringing a wealth of knowledge on the topic, is my old mate, Darren Staniforth, who spent many years on the tools followed by time as an electrical trainer and then technical presenter alongside Tony Cable with the NIC EIC. You may well have seen Darren at Tech Talks and Elix shows, which is where we're recording this podcast today, courtesy of the guys at the Napit stand. Thank you very much, chaps, for the space. Darren is currently with Skullmore as head of technical engagement. And what he doesn't know about consumer units could be written on a BS 1362 fuse case. Here's a taster of what you'll hear. Well, it means basically you need a box that's going to take all your DC, monitor that, going to push it out as AC to some final circuits in the future. Do we need AC final circuits? Consumer unit control unit, prosumer unit that will be already terminated and got modules in it, and then you just have like a kettle of IEC leads and just that's plug it. in the light. That's, that, that, that's what I think the future of consumers will be. Darren, welcome. Great to see you, matey. Thank you very much for the invite. It's been a while, hasn't it? It's been a while. I think it's, it's been a while doing anything, hasn't nice it? Nice to get the old band back together again, <laughs> as you said. <laughs> so consumer units, what, what, what's the story? Where did the idea of a consumer unit first appear? Well, we, we, we sort of started to look at this over at Skullmore because we, we went into consumer unit manufacturing again. We'd done it, tried it, moved away from it, and now we're back into doing it with a new range. But we, me and Jake started to look at where consumer units come from to see if we can add value rather than just selling a metal box. We wanted to add value to, to these. And we've looked right back in the regulations and it, it, the term fuse box comes because they were, they were man-made on site. A lot of sparkies back in the day used to be excellent carpenters because they had to make all the trunking themselves, used to have to make the consumer units. Many of them that were being ripped out today are probably wooden backed or something like that. And that's where people start to, to get the term fuse box. We've always had fuses. Even in the first edition of the regulations, it started to talk about fuses. We just needed somewhere to put them. Yeah. So, Gary, when, when did we start to hear how compliant they had to be? When, when were there some rules about these boxes that we were making? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say post-war on my knowledge here, but, I mean, there was always a requirement for, the, the, say, the fuses and the, and the boxes, but it's about fitting them in the, in the enclosure. They were only about fire, so then they started getting things like Paxlin in the banks because, obviously, it was fitted to wooden structures. Uh, fuses get hot and burn, <laughs> you know. So it was a case of, oh, look, this is catching fire. So, you know, they started to make them a little bit more robust we did, um, yeah. and then as, as we've seen over the over the well say last five years uh, certainly then we've moved to well we had metal clad consuming units in in the sort of 60s and then we went away from it and plastic became thinner and wobblier and so you know <laughs> more fires it was also to do with where they were sighted wasn't it they were being sighted in extremely uh, vulnerable areas like under stair cupboards uh, under the stairs wooden staircases i mean in some sort of houses you know they're actually at, at the front door either to the side or above the door so in the event of a fire how are you going to get out? So yeah, we need to make some changes. So. Yeah, I mean, if you look at where we're putting it or where typically we're putting it, it is in them vulnerable locations. And if you think about most understairs, it's got all the odd pairs of shoes that you don't want anymore, shoe a hoover polish. that doesn't work, yeah, shoe a polish, couple of shoe pieces, pieces bobs in there, and, it's, and flammable, and, and, lots of yeah, stuff. And literally this stuff was just waiting to go up. And the, the opportunity was when a, a, a hot joint occurred inside the consumer unit, whoosh, up the whole thing went. And it was, it was a problem. And now I remember, if you look at the, the wooden ones, when we first talk about a fuse box of some sort being made out of wood and then all of a sudden we went to metal because manufacturing processes got better and mass production was the big thing it's faster quicker and easier to mass produce metal ones you could put them through on a production line they would just come off the other end looking like a, a fuse box and then all of a sudden we started to manufacture differently in plastic so that's where the plastic ones came in because it's cheaper to manufacture and do so so we went through a process of ripping out all the metal, putting in plastic. And now, now what go, are we doing? Now we go, putting metal back in. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. But for, all for safety, you know, it's all good stuff. But, it's all I mean, development, isn't it? Yeah. It is. But, I mean, what's happened is over the years with new sets of regulations, there all seems to be a slight twist to say you need a new consumer unit because of this, an extra gadget, you know, fire. I can actually hear people nodding. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah like, always. And, and the thing is, you, you could have worked for a client and said, oh, new regulations, you need a new consumer unit. We've got to fit various devices like RCVs. Well, this, I was going to ask you next, Darren, because I remember us talking about it when we were doing some presentations about the fact that when AFDDs first appeared, they were double, double they units. Were. Oh. And so consumer units were going to be vast. Scary so, time, wasn't it? When we first started yeah. to talk about AFDDs, literally, me and David started to get into the nitty gritty. The only devices were double pole. Now, this meant that your consumer unit that's Typically, 10 ways would be a 20-way consumer. <laughs> Thankfully, yeah. manufacturers like us have managed to get the stuff down so it's one module again now, which takes away that scare. You would never fit in it under a stairs. Your under stairs would have needed to be wider than what it is at the moment. You, you so talk to most consumers, there. and when they talk about a new consumer, they say, I really don't care what it is, what it looks like. All I want it is smaller and prettier than the last one because they're not very nice looking at in the hallway. So, you know, it's... But like a 20-way board, and this is what we're <laughs> going to talk about, size, you know... Oh, physical size. Is, is, so, uh, so, this is it. so, manufacturers, we will be guided by what people like to install. So, as long as it's compliant with regulations, we will listen to all those people that are going to be fitting it, and they all say, we want space. If you then go to the end user, the client, they want it as small as possible because it's ugly. So, we've got to find, as a manufacturer that happy medium. So give it enough space for the sparkies to be able to wire it easily, but don't make it too big so it sits and looks really horrible on the wall. It really is a hard thing to do. The practicality of wiring is a nightmare, isn't it? You've got to get those cables either under, behind, yeah, or you yeah. run around the side, and, and no one quite does it the same way. No, and, and well, nowadays, let's face it, RCBOs is the way to go. Everyone's going down that route, and they're moving away from a dual split load board. So you've got all the fly leads that come off those RCBOs as well. And people are saying, what do we do with them? You tie wrap them, bunch them together. All of a sudden, you've lost about a third of your consuming it space because of all these leads that are there. And that is a problem that we're going to have to look at and, as manufacturers and try and overcome. The, the point that you just picked up on, on all, all the components that go in, you know, obviously we want it reduced. I mean, all three of us have stood on the stage to talk about the practicalities of it, the, the tidiness, the, the convenience of having one device to control a circuit, which is great. But what about the connection, the speed? I mean, because time is money. I'm aware of an organisation that's got contactless terminals. Yeah, so yeah. If that, would that, will we ever see that in consumer units? Has that ever been looked at from your point well, of view? Well, have a look at terminals across the whole of our sector. We always used to like the fact that you could get a screwdriver and my old friend Tony Cale would say once tight, oh, tight, too tight, tight is yeah. something else. So, so you, <laughs> you, used to, you used to really get older. You used to give it a good old touch. We now know that you can't do that. No, you can but, over-tighten that. But, but look at what we're doing as an electrical industry. We are moving away from terminals. We're going to go push for everything. And you will see it in consumer units as well. I think we will. I have no doubt at all that consumer units will be fit in, in the future. They'll sit on a wall and you will plug your final circuits into it. I have no doubt that that's where we going to go do you, do you know that that's happening are you developing now or can you talk well, we, we're looking at the future and we know full well that the regulations are moving towards a, a prosumer that's came out and it's quite clear that that's the direction if we look at harmonized documents above they talk about prosumer installations quite a lot in the harmonized documents so we know it's going to come into the uk at some point so us as manufacturers are looking, what does it mean for a prosumer well it means basically you need a box that's going to take all your dc monitor that, going to push it out as AC to some final circuits in the future. Do we need AC final circuits? So this box is not just going to be a consumer unit anymore. It's going to be a prosumer unit. Yeah. I mean, you've, you, talking about the DC, you've got solar PV, so that That's generates it. DC. We've got batteries from cars. Yeah. I mean, what I was going to just ask you there is, do you, for, for the installer, do you think there will be a consumer unit control unit, prosumer unit, that will be already terminated and got modules in it, and then you just have like a kettle with IEC lead and just plug in your light. That's, that, that's what I think the future of consumers will be. I don't think actually contractors will need to take the lid off and go in anymore. I think literally they will just terminate their final circuit with a plug into one of these ports that are available. I mean, Dave and I do some other presentations. We've been talking about power over Ethernet. So, you know, your RJ45 is like you can go straight to your LED light. So, I mean, for the speed of this for the contractor, I mean, that's going to be a, a massive time saver for them. Well, we, we are aware, um, at Skullmore, we're always looking for the future, what's coming up, what's looking at next. And we are aware that there are moves in the construction industry to have modular systems around. So all construction now, they're looking to try and ensure that 40% of major construction is done off-site. So they just bring it to site, plug it together, and that's it. That includes consuming it, some wiring, so your final circuits will be plug and play. That's, that's where we're going to go to as an industry. It's going to become plug and play. So it's all done off-site. It's issued to site and it's just plugged in and it should be ready to go. 
a vision, a vision. You heard it first here. And by the way, another podcast in this series will be talking to Luke Osborne and looking at the whole prosumer thing and what's going on and what the ECA are doing to regulate that. That's another one. Check out that. Let's come back to the world we're living in right now uh, and say how a few of the things that are un- people are unsure about. How far away from the cutout fuse can a consumer unit be installed? Does the old three meter rule still apply? Well, we we good at Skullwall. We've got some, an amazing support team, and the calls that we get are constantly about this. So. Can you put this, your new illusion, can you put it so many metres away? Well, actually, yes, you can. And, and there's some really good resources that are out there. The Electrical Safety First have got a really good answer for this. And it's the industry coming together for an answer. So it's not just what Darren says or anyone else says. It's the industry coming together to say, yes, you can. However, it then goes on to say, you can talk to your DNO. Now, they will probably let you use that main fuse for anything longer than two or three metres. However, you need to get there understanding that, that, that their main fuse is going to be looking after your distribution circuit as well. If you can't get that, and I'll be honest with you, trying to get that permission is going to be pretty hard. Because they're not, they're, 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 been there. Yeah, they're, not, they're not just sitting there waiting for our phone call. They've got other things to do as well. So at that point there, the Spark is not going to sit around and wait. They're going to just want to get on with the job and get paid and get on to the next job. So at that point, they'll say, right, I've got to put something in. So they'll put some sort of isolator within the two or three metres then creating a distribution circuit for the consuming it that it needs to be more than the three metres away. That's what we're generally seeing. I've heard um, contractors say that it's been 12 to 15 metres away, right? And they feel that the isolator is okay, but obviously we know that it's, you've, you've, you've installed a circuit, so therefore we're looking for some overcurrent protection. That's it. So yeah. you really should go for a few switch or some other sort of mechanism to do that, but that's where it. does that go? Do you, well, do you... That's another thing, Gary. So we can ask, because we, we do make this switch that can go in and, and be used for your sub circuit. And people say, can I put it in the meter cupboard? And we're like, look, really, no, you can't, because that meter cupboard is the, the property of the DNO or the meter organisation, so you need to get their permission if you're going to put anything in there. And we know they don't give it. <laughs> no, no, they don't give it. And, and I know on social media, I've seen a number of uh, oh. photos, videos that, that you've shown kit fit in there. But yeah. as a former Seaboard and Eastern Electricity employee, that, that space is sacrosanct. They've got the cutout, they've got the meter, they've got the time clock, and that space that they think there's nothing there is for a check meter. Now, over, over the years, these meters and time clocks have got much smaller, so that, but they think it's free retail space and, and it's not the case. <laughs> so watch this space. Don't, 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 don't install it. The, the whole business with isolators, I mean, some have them, some don't. What, what, what does a Sparky do? Because I mean, there are a number of questions that we've all faced saying, do I pull or don't I pull? How do I pull? How do I isolate? Yeah, so I think we used to do a lot of work with um, in, in my former occupation. I used to do a lot with the, the, the health and safety executive, asking them that question. So you're going to replace a consumer unit. Should you or shouldn't you pull that main fuse? Some DNOs will give permission to qualified, competent electricians to do that. Some will ask for a course. Now, when I've done a lot of research uh, around about 2010 into this, this is how much it varied. So you used to ring up in about Southampton, you used to ring up, and if you, as long as you were registered with one of the competent person scheme, you're in. You could go and pull their main fuse, not a problem. You then went up to Yorkshire and you had to sit a five-day course to be able to pull the main fuse and become registered with them. And that's the variances across the UK that we were seeing. There wasn't, oh, they got very close to coming together and agreeing one standard, but then that sort of Every time we get there, they pull back and say, no, we don't want unlicensed people working on the network. That's the problem. And, and as far as I'm aware, that is still current practice. They, they feel that there's, there's revenue protection. But, I mean, under the Electricity Work Regulation 14, you, you yeah. can't work live. So well, that's it. You, you mean, me and you, we stood up before and we get this question, what do we do? How do we do it? Well, fortunately, you do need to go down the route of not complying with either the Electricity Work Regulations or not complying with the DNO. And I know for well, let's take it to the ultimate. Let's say someone does a consumer unit change without pulling that main fuse and they get a shock. The health and safety system will be all over you like a rash. So I think the, the, the answer here is, look, make sure you're safe. We know that by pulling that main fuse, you're probably not complying with the requirements of the local distribution network operator. However, you're safer. I won't say you're safe because there's a lot of dangers around pulling that main fuse, there isn't are. there? I mean, we were only talking yesterday with a fellow colleague, uh, Gary Parker at the ECA, and he was saying, you could pull that fuse a hundred times, but that one time you pull it out and it draws an arc or something oh, like that, I know. it could be serious consequences. Yeah. The, the, whoever pulls a fuse it is liable to prosecution. It is that yes. it's protected under law from the electricity board side of things. But there may be 
situation that you're called out in an emergency. It's caught fire. You know, there's no one there. If, so uh, for safety reasons, you know, it would be... Well, it's the lesser sensible. of two evils, isn't it? That's, it that's, is. That's, so you say, look, it's, it's not exactly safe. That, People yeah. are at risk of this fire was going to carry on, so I felt safe and then I needed to put it right. So there's going to be an odd case for that. I'm, I'm aware of that. But on the point of con connections and working live, I was, we had a meeting with the HSE a couple of weeks ago and their position is still, still, and always has been, if there is a safer way yeah. of working, we will always expect it. Yep. So never, never working live. So you've, I don't know if you've seen in meter covers now, people are using clamps around meter tails to get EV a kit. That's it. And they're saying, it's, we can do that live. Yeah, I've but seen they, that a lot. Yeah, yeah, I know. And they're saying, it's well, one we've just talked about, that you don't want that kit in that room, in that box. And the second thing is, it's working live. And there is a safer way. And there is a safer so, way, yep. These, these new clamps that you can see, they, they literally, they are, without you having to cut into the towels, you clip them around, you tighten them up, and that's it. You're, you're terminating them onto, on, onto live on, conductors. Yes. So, yeah, so there, there are risks around it. But as you said there, Dave, it's the lesser of two evils. Your new role that you're now in is about education. How can, how can SGTV... Skolmore, how, how are they helping contractors? Well, we are here at Skolmore on a bit of a journey. We, we're trying to ensure that we don't just manufacture things and push it out there and hope that people fall over it. We just want people to understand how to install our stuff better and safer, to get a full understanding of what that little bit of kit does or what it should be doing. So here at Skolmore, part of my job and part of my remit is to ensure that we underpin everything that we manufacture with safety standards and with ensuring that there's a bit of education at the back of it as well so people can come to us and can do cpd we've got lots of information available as you said there sgtv so if people on youtube or on podcasts are searching for skull wall group they'll find sgtv it's got loads of bits on there that either me and jake are talking about and consuming it compliance is one of them we've done Fire rated downlighters. We've oh loads, loads and loads to, to, to far too many to mention, but <laughs> there's loads there. And it's all about basically we're not just a manufacturer, we're a responsible manufacturer that also wants to ensure that people fitting our stuff know what they're fitting. Darren, as always, a fantastic opportunity to talk to you, full of information, full of fun, and some words about the future as well. So thanks very much for joining us great, today. Great stuff. Yeah. Thanks, Darren. Thanks for the invite. It's been brilliant. We should do it again, guys. Let's do it again. <laughs> Should we do it now? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to our guest, Darren Staniforth, for a fascinating glimpse of the future of the humble, or maybe not so humble, consuming unit. And of course, to Gary Gundry. So what do you think? Were you consumed by interest? Well, whatever your response, I hope you find this podcast informative and useful. And if you did, then check out other podcasts in the Electrical Safety Network series. I'm Dave Austin. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.